Probably. Cool. Okay, Nicola, please uh, welcome people. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this second installment of the lecture series, Northern African Ottoman Relations in History. Apologies for the delay, we were dealing with some technical issues as it happens these days. Um, so this lecture series is a partnership between the Society for Libyan Studies and the British Institute at Ankara. Um, the principal aim of these online lectures is to further strengthen the existing collaborations among the British International Research Institutes uh, under the sponsorship of the British Academy. Um, while the focus is on different geographical areas, uh, all of these institutes share the same values and interests in disseminating research. Uh, the Society for Libyan Studies supports work on Libya and Northern Africa in general, uh, from prehistory to modern times, uh, but it also explores the wider interconnectivity across the Mediterranean and beyond. And therefore, these, the, the idea of starting this new joint collaboration with the British Institute at Ankara. Uh, these lectures are looking at a range of historical, socio-political and cultural themes within the context of the Ottoman world. And the historical and geographical framework under consideration is a rather broad one, which encompasses the territories of present day Turkey, Libya and Northern Africa. Uh, in the first lecture of the series by Odile Moreau, uh, we looked at Libya in the age of reforms. And tonight we're gonna look at the Italo-Ottoman War. And the series will be concluded with a third lecture, which will be by John Slight on the 25th of November. So stay tuned for that. And now I will hand over to my colleague, Daniel, who will introduce tonight's speaker and topic. Okay. Thanks, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Benjamin Fortner, our speaker. But first, I will just go over very briefly um, the way in which this webinar format works. Um, you might have seen that there is, uh, for the audience, two features, a uh, chat box where you're welcome to introduce yourself. Um, you'll see some people have already uh, dropped a message there just to give us an idea of the uh, where our audience are coming from this evening. Um, there is also a Q&A box. And, and if you do have a question, either during the lecture or or for the after, uh, use the Q&A button to leave your question and we'll make sure to get um, to as many of those questions as possible within our time constraints uh, for Benjamin to answer. So, uh, yes, as I mentioned, this is the second lecture and I think picks up very nicely from the uh, what we heard from Odile Moreau last month um, on the 19th century and early 20th century history of Ottoman, uh, or Ottoman Libya. Um, Benjamin Fortner um, is professor and director of the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona. And for many years, he was also professor in the history of Middle East at, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, part of the University of London. It's from then that our connection with uh, Benjamin Fortner uh, originates, where he was briefly on the British Institute at Ankara's um, council. Um, and we try and keep in touch and keep collaborating despite his uh, having moved over to the United States now. Um, he's published on a wide variety of subjects in late Ottoman history. Um, childhood what is the topic of one of his books. Learning to read um, and literacy in the Ottoman Empire and Republic is the topic of another. Uh, he's currently working on a project on multilingualism in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but his connection to the topic of this evening is, uh, is his work on um, Eshref Bey, uh, who I'm sure we'll be hearing more about. 
Um, that was published in a book titled The Circassian, A Life of Esheref Bey, Late Ottoman Insurgent and Special Agent, published by Hearst and Oxford University Press in 2016. And as I'm sure you're all aware, we'll tonight be listening to his lecture on the Ottoman-Italian War of 1911 to 1912. Um, over to you, Benjamin. Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel, and, and thank you, Nicolo. And um, it's a very kind introduction, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be back uh, in association with the BIAA and, and for the first time for me, the Society for Libyan Studies. So it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, particular thanks to uh, our colleague Odile Moreau for her excellent lecture last time. I won't be able to live up to it, but it but she does um, place us in, in, a, in a very nice uh context for the, for this evening's talk. So I, I, I thank her uh, for that. I enjoyed her lecture very much uh, the last time. So as I say, um, I'm, I'm not a North Africanist. I'm not a historian of Libya. Um, as Daniel indicated, I, I sort of followed a, a late Ottoman character, uh, emphasis on the word character, uh, to, to uh, Trouble Scarb, to um, the region we're talking about today uh, during this war in, in 1911. Uh, and so my interest in, in the Ottoman side of things uh, stems from that uh, earlier work. Um, in this presentation, I'll rely on some of the material. Uh, I've been trying to distance myself a little bit from that earlier project um, that, that, that uh, appeared in Ashraf's uh, remarkable uh, trunk of papers, uh, but also add to it with some other uh, materials. I've had the pleasure in preparing for this uh, talk to revisit some, some sources I was familiar with from my earlier work, but also discovering quite happily some, some newer material, uh, in particular the, um, the Military History of the Ottomans by Mesut Uyar and uh, Edward Erickson, uh, an excellent uh, PhD dissertation from, the UCLA, from UCLA uh, by Jonathan McCollum called The Anti-Colonial Empire about this conflict. And most recently, uh, a book I was completely unaware of uh, by Pierre Schiel, uh, in, in from France, on uh, the the um, called uh, Réveiller l'archive, um, Réveiller l'archive d'une guerre coloniale, and it's about uh, the the photographs and texts that were uh, that I'll refer to in a, in a little bit uh, that were created by um, a French uh, writer who was sent to the front. Uh, to cover the, the Italian side of the conflict uh, by uh, a, a French paper. Um, a, a brief word on, on terminology. Um, I'm well aware that it's anachronistic in this period that we're talking about this evening to talk about Libya. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's quite convenient to use uh, fewer syllables than many. It's, correctly speaking, we would talk about the Italo-Ottoman War for Tripolitania. Uh, it's a little bit of a handful. And Tripolitania also doesn't cover the full extent. It, it, we're, we're talking, of course, about uh, the Ottoman province of, of Trablusgarb, Tripolitania, but also the Sanjak um, of uh, Bidgazi, uh, which is usually referred in the, in the West as uh, Saranaica. Um, so because of this sort of use of geographical synecdoche, referring to a, a part of the territory to denote the whole, uh, we have this uh, uh, sort of terminological confusion. But um, it's similar in a way to the situation we encounter in late Ottoman Iraq, where we don't, there is no such thing as, as Ottoman Iraq, generally speaking. There are three conferences, three, three uh, um, vilayets that become uh, later on uh, the country of Iraq. But it's, it's much easier, of course, to refer to it that way. So uh, please understand what if I do slip in and use the word Libya, it's, uh, it's just for, for um, the purposes of, 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 um, of convenience. Now, let me try at, at first to uh, advance the, yeah, and the delay is entirely my fault and due to my uh, incompetence with respect to, uh, now my slides are not advancing. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. So, um, I will um, first try to sort of set out a little bit of 
the context for this uh, this conflict very briefly because Odile's done a, a, such an excellent job of setting it up for us. Uh, but some of you, I realize, weren't at the last lecture. A very cursory look at the Italian side of things. Um, Italy uh, demonstrated a very long-standing attempt to secure what it called Libya for, for itself using a variety of diplomatic and, and economic means. Um, in, as early as 1887, it secured German recognition of Italian interests uh, in, in the region. Uh, by 1902, both, both France and Great Britain had agreed to safeguard Italian interests there. And later uh, it, it won the same um, same uh, agreement from Russia and Austria-Hungary. So it was very carefully setting about uh, an eventual uh, move on the territory. As a result, uh, popular opinion in Italy began to develop perhaps an overly optimistic assessment of how future Italian rule uh, would be received by the local population. And the event that, that precipitated uh, the, the um, decision to um, announced an ultimatum and then eventually uh, invade the territory came in 1911, the Agadir crisis, when Germany sent a warship to Morocco to test, test uh, French resolve there, accelerating Italian uh, planning for Libya. There was a fear of sort of that another power might swoop in and, and, and take uh, the former Roman imperial uh, territory. Uh, so Italy began to make a number of complaints to the Ottoman Empire about uh, the way its, its citizens were being treated in the province, and we can see generally a, a, an escalation of, of claims and demands. Um, and Britain uh, made clear, very clear, its sympathy for Italy in the event of any conflict. So the Ottomans knew that they were increasingly in, in a difficult uh, situation. When the Ottoman uh, military decided to try to shore up the um, troops it had in Libya, which had been depleted when many of them were sent to fight uh, in Yemen against the revolt there, um, Italy reacted with the ultimatum. The, the res Ottoman response was, was relatively conciliatory, but not sufficiently so to constitute the response that Rome was demanding. Um, from the Ottoman side of things, uh, it was clear that uh, the, the, the Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP government that had come to power sort of behind the scenes after the revolution of 1908, um, despite all their anti-imperial rhetoric, they were sufficiently pragmatic to realize that the Ottoman government needed European or great power support if it were to survive. Thus, somewhat ironically, they began to initially to follow the policy of their defeated predecessor, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, about whom uh, Odile uh, spoke to us last time, um, playing up the strategic advantage of the empire's role in the Muslim world and the symbolic position of the caliphate. As a practical necessity, they, su they supported an alliance with Britain while continuing to strengthen ties with Germany as a kind of leverage. But events would make an alliance with Britain impossible. The Ottoman Empire, of course, would be drawn closer to Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, but in the meantime, uh, the Ottoman Empire's role vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world took a more clearly anti-imperialist direction, as we'll, uh, as we'll discover later on. And the, the Trablusgarb War, this uh, Italo-Ottoman conflict in, in Libya, uh, was, I think, an important uh, event in the development of this trend. As I said, the Committee of Union Progress came to power in 1908, um, acted, ruled first uh, from behind the scenes. Uh, and the war, uh, the, the Italian ultimatum and eventual invasion uh, offered the young government the, the chance, as they saw that, to, to right the, the wrongs of previous uh, Ottoman em Empire um, uh, acquiescence in the face of European great power bullying, the way they saw it. So there was a lot of, uh, gusto, a lot of daring do, and a lot of excitement about the prospect of taking on uh, a European power. I have a few uh, maps here to show the way the, the territory looked uh, from the Ottoman point of view. There's one map showing everything in one map. I'm sorry about the resolution on some of these. Uh, and there's uh, the province of uh, Tripoli and the Sanjak of, of uh, Benghazi. 
Cyrenaica, basically. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the conflict came for the Ottomans at, at perhaps the worst possible time. The Ottoman military was in the er early stages of a major reorganization uh, commenced in 1909, designed to rationalize the military along German lines. Uh, this was organized by Ahmed Izet Pasha, a protege of, of the German Marshal uh, von der Goltz. The idea was to remove some of the practices associated with their predecessor, uh, Abdul Hamid II, and otherwise modernize the army. Um, I won't go into the details of all the, 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 the restructuring, but it was a major effort and, and one that uh, meant that the, the empire was, was uh, hardly ready for a, a major conflict. The timing, in other words, couldn't have been worse for the Ottomans to, to engage in any new war. While the Ottoman military was at this vulnerable moment, um, in which according to Uyar and Erickson, the, old, the pillars of the old order had been destroyed while the new ones were unready to carry the whole system, it now had to face not one, but two conflicts in succession. And then of course, a third and ultimately fatal fight. In the last lecture, uh, Odile Moreau did an excellent job of laying out, setting out the scene. The Ottoman uh, presence in Libya changes in 1901, 1902, military reforms, end of the draft exemption, uh, the um, creation of a census, construction of the ports, and also of explaining uh, the importance of the Sanusiya uh, order, its expansion, its trans-Saharan dimension, and the succession to the leadership of the order of Ahmed al-Sharif, uh, Sayyid Ahmed al-Sharif in 1902, and the uh, support between, uh, of Ahmed al-Sharif and the Sanusiya from Istanbul, um, represented by the, uh, the sending of weapons, uh, which were stored in, in Darna, Derne, according to the Ottomans, uh, which would become an important uh, center uh, when the war broke out. Uh, by the 1890s, we see the appearance of the Italian project for uh, what, the, what Rome called Libya, um, echoing the, the, the imperial uh, Roman uh, name, and also the beginning of local enforcement, the reinforcement of the uh, Ottoman Sanusi ties, as was mentioned, um, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the long running uh, franco sunusi war uh, in the, to the south. Um, when, as a result of the ultimatum I mentioned earlier, when the war broke out, um, uh, it was, the, the, everything happened really quickly. Uh, war was hastily declared on September 29th, 1911. Uh, the city of, of Tobruk fell on the 4th of October and Tripoli on the 5th. The first group of Ottoman officers arrived in the middle of, 19, of October 1911, but continued to appear well into 1912. And of course, the, the problem for the Ottomans was that uh, given the uh, Italian naval dominance uh, at sea, uh, officers could only sneak into Libya, either through Egypt which was uh, problematic because of uh, British control or through Tunisia, but equally problematic because of the French, because the, the French and British had declared neutrality and were bent on keeping uh, Ottoman uh, troops and materiel uh, out of the conflict zone. It was inconceivable for the Ottomans to send large numbers of forces. So it was essentially a skeletal officer corps that began to be assembled uh, in the, the, um, in the territory. The key figure from the Ottoman point of view was Major Ismail Enver. Um, here he is in, in a couple of years before the conflict uh, commenced. And he set up his quarters at uh, Ayn al uh, sorry, at Ayn al Mansur uh, near Darna um, after uh, Benghazi had been uh, occupied by Italian forces. Enver was, of course, the charismatic hero, or one of the heroes of the 1908 uh, revolution. Um, he, is, he was in the midst of a meteoric rise through the ranks of the Ottoman military, and also not um, inconsiderable in this situation, in this context. Uh, he was engaged to marry an Ottoman princess, uh, which linked him, of course, very strongly to the dynasty and to the caliphate in the eyes of the local population. The, the, 
Ottoman forces that had been in, in Libya before, um, or, or Tripoli before the conflict, uh, has been described by uh, military historians we are and Erickson as, as one of the worst uh, divisions of the empire. And of course, it was at half strength, as mentioned, because of the, the troops that had been sent to Libya. When the fighting started, uh, local recruits quickly deserted, um, and yet the, the, the division managed to withdraw and to engage in small hit and run raids against the Italians, it, trying to infiltrate the Italian perimeter. Um, and the key was to buy time to train and to integrate and rely on, on the tribal fighting men. So this is the, the crucial relationship here is between the Ottoman military officers, many of whom trained through the war college uh, with uh, the Sanusia forces and a number of other uh, volunteers, as we'll see. A crucial aspect of this, and here's a, here's a slide of uh, probably difficult to see, but a fuzzy picture from Eshref's collection showing Enver and Mustafa Kemal and Ashraf uh, reviewing um, a detachment of uh, Sanusia troops. And we'll see in some further photographs the, the contrast in, 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 uh, in, in uniform and in clothing between the Ottomans, usually in their wool, uh, wool uniforms and the Sanusia and their, their flowing uh, gowns, robes symbolizing the, the, the difference in background and, and approach of the two uh, forces. But it was a, it was a crucial uh, relationship for this, um, for this context. So we can talk about uh, something we, that I can perhaps think of as, as the fedai factor. The fedais were the, the, the self-sacrificing officers, the, the, the volunteers, the, what, what uh, we are in Erickson referred to as the best and the brightest. They actually included some who weren't really the best of the brightest as well, but uh, it, that, that phrase uh, captures the fact that, as, as I said, some of these were uh, the, the cream of the Ottoman officer corps and those who would go on to uh, leading roles in future conflicts, and of course included uh, Mustafa Kemal himself, pictured here, uh, who would of course become uh, the founder of the Turkish Republic at the end of uh, World War I. The arrival of these, uh, these key officers effectively uh, tipped the balance in, in the war. And um, th these men were, were attempting to, to prove a point not only to the great powers of Europe, but also to, to the more uh, conservative uh, parts of the Ottoman government, um, whom the activist officers considered to have failed in responding to the crisis and being ins insignificant, in insufficiently um, zealous in, in defending Ottoman territory wherever it was. So they, they saw this as, as a kind of slipping into the previous mode uh, exhibited by Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and they were determined uh, not to let that history uh, repeat itself. There was a general reluctance on the part of the Ottoman government to defy the Western powers, uh, worried about the consequences of, of losing great power support in any conflict, and with good reason given uh, the events of the, of the long 19th century. So the fighters, the officers who, who assembled, almost all of whom had had experience in Macedonia, uh, fighting the, the, the counterinsurgency forces, uh, a number of counterinsurgency forces ranged against the Ottoman Empire there. And this experience was crucial because now in Libya, they would effectively try to turn the tables and to fight an insurgency uh, against uh, a more traditionally organized uh, European army. So you have a few few images here to share. That's a picture of Enver's tent headquarters at Ain al-Mansur, photograph taken by uh, Eshref. Uh, an interesting side note is, it, is that he had access to a dark room uh, Eshref did during this conflict and seems to have developed uh, his, his uh, penchant for uh, photography and learned the trade uh, while in the field. So we have some, some uh, sometimes not very clear, but um, interesting photographs uh, taken by Eshref uh, or, or others that ended up in his, his collection afterwards. This gives you a sense of the, the type of uh, men together. In, in the last row, um, we have uh, someone I can't identify in the upper left, and then uh, Kel Ali, Ali, later known as Ali Chetinkaya, 
an important uh, friend and, and uh, ally of Mustafa Kemal. And then uh, next to him, uh, to our right, uh, Izmit Le Mumtaz, who was the aide de camp to, uh, to uh, Enver, and uh, Kushibashi Ashref uh, on the right, looking quite uh, pleased with himself, it has to be said. Uh, also, uh, as mentioned, uh, Mustafa Kemal, uh, who traveled to the conflict um, alongside uh, 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 some people he, he later uh, tried to um, dis dis disengage himself from, including uh, the, the, this figure of Yakub Jamil, who was in some ways the wildest of the, of the uh, young Turk Fedai officers. And he, here you see a picture of him in, in uh, shooting the Ottoman uh, Grand Vizier in the, in the coup d'etat uh, from a few years uh, later. So the, 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 the Ottoman officers who assembled in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in Libya, let's say, uh, included uh, a, a fascinating group of characters who uh, all, many of whom played significant roles in, in subsequent uh, conflicts and in the emergence of, um, in, in the Balkan Wars, in World War I, and in many cases in the emergence of the Turkish Republic afterwards. Some went on, especially the Arab officers among them, went on to play important roles in Arab states uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire including in Egypt and most particularly in, in Iraq. Uh, so we have a number of key figures, including uh, Yassin al-Hashimi, Jafar al-Askari, Nuri al-Said, um, and um, as well as uh, someone like uh, Fawzi al-Kulchi, who, who, who led the resistance against the British uh, in Palestine. Um, so we have Enver, as I said, uh, Suleiman Askari, who would go on to form and lead uh, the, um, the special organization, the Teshkilat e Masasa, that uh, Odile referred to last time. Um, Enver's younger brother, Nuri, um, Izmitli Mumtaz, whom I mentioned, uh, Mustafa Kemal, of course, Ali Fethi Okyar, uh, Ali Chetinkaya, and uh, a number of others. Aziz Ali al Misri, so called the Egyptian. Um, the poet and propagandist for the CUP, Omer Naji, Eshref, as we've mentioned, and uh, people like Yakub Jamil and Sapanja Lahaku, uh, a very high percentage of, of Circassians, typical of the ranks of the Fedai or the Teskilati Masasa officers uh, after that organization was founded uh, after the Balkan Wars. So we can actually say that they were, in some ways, yes, the best and the brightest, but also some perhaps just the most gung-ho. There's some evidence of a kind of haphazard military organization, which is perhaps the reason that Suleiman Askeri was sent uh, by Enver to, to uh, Libya to try to reorganize uh, the situation. Um, but there he uh, clashed with other officers, perhaps because he was trying to, to uh, install and still a kind of um, discipline that had been lacking in the early days of the conflict. And uh, as I'll come to in a minute, there are a number of feuds that, that originate from this time period between this key group of officers. Getting to the front was a major challenge for many of these, of these officers, given uh, the problems uh, of, of um, British and French control of Egypt and uh, Libya, the neighboring territories, respectively. Um, but I've, we've come across a number of accounts that, that detail that the struggle and the obstacles that uh, a number of these officers overcame. Um, Suleiman Askari, for example, and a group of officers traveled all the way from Baghdad. We have a good account of that that appears in, in Ashraf's papers. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a portion of Suleiman Askari's diaries from his showing his trip or detailing his trip from the Western desert of Egypt across into Libya, uh, complete with uh, Eshref's editorial comments because he uh, found the, the papers and, and, and edited them and presented and transcribed them later on. Um, they, they over, the obstacles overcome by some of these officers included the opposition of senior Ottoman officials who didn't really want uh, the, the Ottoman Empire to get involved in this conflict. 
uh, questions of finance, and of course, as mentioned, the, the, the British uh, and French opposition to their, uh, their traveling there. Some of them went incognito, and here we can see a group uh, in the Western desert uh, of, uh, of Egypt uh, dressed up as, uh, as Muslim seminary students. Uh, and this picture includes uh, a number of people I'll referring to later on, including uh, Sheikh Saleh Sharif, the Tunisian uh, notable and, and alim, um, as well as uh, one of the sons of uh, Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, the, the hero of the uh, Algerian resistance to the French. From the perspective of these uh, Fedai officers, the war in Trablus Garb was a cause, a real mission. Apart from the ongoing and seemingly endless counterinsurgency that they had uh, encountered in Macedonia, the Tripolitanian War represented the first clear cut chance to invoke this activist stance I, I referred to, to discard the passive style of the previous regime of Abdul Hamid II, which they had criticized so fiercely in opposition, and of course, to take on a European power. Tactically, they were eager to turn the tables and adopt the tactics, tactics of, of insurgency that had been deployed so effectively against them as the sort of Ottoman sitting ducks in, in, in Macedonia. Um, and to do so, uh, so they're adopting the, 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 poly, the, the tactics of, of insurgency uh, uh, was, was, a, was a welcome uh, and, and um, uh, sort of long-standing wish of, of some of these officers. And to do so not simply in defense of Ottoman lands, but for the sake of the broader uh, Muslim world. And that's a point we'll, we'll come to um, in, in a bit. So there was a battle, not just, not just in, in the field, but also a battle for public opinion that was really crucial to this, uh, to this conflict. A brief word on, uh, on tactics. I'm not a military historian, but uh, I think it's important to try to understand what, the, what the, uh, these officers uh, in connection with the, the Sanusia fighting men were attempting to do. They were organized, they organized themselves as sort of mission oriented units, you could say, combining regular soldiers, uh, gendarmerie forces, volunteers, tribal warriors, under the command of regular officers from Istanbul, many of whom, of course, were graduates of the Ottoman Staff College, modeled on the German system. Their aim was to fight an asymmetric war of attrition and not to try to take and hold territory. In fact, the, their major losses from the Ottoman side in this conflict came when they tried to hold territory and abandon uh, briefly uh, this, this sort of tactical plan. They planned on a long conflict in which morale would become a or perhaps the key uh, factor. They set out to frustrate the Italians, who, of course, were expecting a relatively easy time. Some have said it, they referred to it as a, a military uh, parade, uh, uh, a cakewalk, we might say. I think the Niccolo can, can correct me, but I think the term I've read is uh, passaggiata militare. So they expected a, a quick um, and, and sort of triumphal uh, conquest of the territory. Uh, and did not expect the, the, the stiff resistance that, um, that they faced. And to a certain extent, until they later changed tactics, the Italians at least initially played into their hands. They presented long columns of infantry, uh, taking advantage of the fact that they had a huge superiority in numbers. And these became easy targets for the hit and run attacks, the skirmishes, the ambushes, and attempts to lure the invaders into the deep desert valleys, the wadis of, us, of the uh, interior. At times, whole columns were dispersed, set upon, and, and driven into pieces and destroyed. There were night raids. There was uh, infiltration of picket lines, the hunting of isolated sentries, and the seizure of arms from Italian uh, uh, depots, and further degrading uh, Italian morale in the process. The frustrated Italian uh, troops uh, sometimes took to, and I have, let me move the slides along. Uh, this, I'll come back to this later, but this, this shows the Ottoman attempt to uh, marshal what we might call Muslim, uh, international Muslim VIP. So here we have Enver, the three in the front, Enver, Enver's father, and Sheikh Saleh Sharif, uh, the Tunisian notable, and in the back, uh, the, the, the line of uh, Sanusi, Sanusi uh, fighters and, and other volunteers. 
here's a picture from kind of fuzzy picture. There's another version of it coming up in a minute showing a captured Italian uh, flag. And there's Eshref in the middle and Ali Chetinkaya here on the right. Slightly better picture of it here in the upper right. Um, you can see this photograph has been made into something like a, like a postcard. Um, and th this gives us a hint into the sort of propaganda uses and the, and the audience uh, that, that the uh, Ottomans were, were interested in, 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 um, in communicating with, with respect to this, um, this war. Uh, this also gives you a sense maybe of the sort of scattered nature of Eshref's archive, a number of just almost sort of random photographs together. This one on the upper left is irrelevant. That's from a later period, but these other three are all, all reflect uh, the fighting or the front uh, activity uh, in, in Libya. Not great photographs perhaps, but gives you a sense of the terrain and the ranks of volunteers here. Um, this is, uh, he, Eshref has labeled this uh, Eshref's Bedouin forces in Barka, the Sanusis. We also, from Eshref's uh, papers, we have sort of evidence of the way in which the organization worked uh, linking uh, the tribal fighters and the Ottoman officers. So this is a request for back pay presented by um, uh, local fighters. The letter first went to Enver Pasha. Uh, Enver, whose signature is here, uh, sent it on to Mustafa Kemal, uh, who was then in, in the commander of uh, Hassa. And he then sent it to Eshref, uh, who was um, the uh, commander, uh, uh, the, the sector commander uh, working directly under, uh, under Mustafa Kemal. And eventually uh, the men were uh, pay, but it, it, it's not so much important the details, but but it shows you the sort of the communication structure um, between the men, and of course also we get a, a sense in their quite um, impressive signatures that uh, some sense of the amour propre or the or the ego involved in some of these characters, which of course led to um, a number of clashes that had resonance uh, in the later stages of of the of the Ottoman Empire's life. The war effectively uh, produced a stalemate. Uh, eventually the Italians decided to stay in the safety of the coastal areas protected by their naval guns. They tried to play to their strengths. They used the, the, the concept of naval blockade, bombardment uh, from the sea. And, uh, but a, a degree of frustration also appeared by the spring of, uh, winter spring of 1912, they turned to shelling various locations away from Libya in the Red Sea in the Syrian uh, coast and, 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 and uh, on the Aegean coast as well. So Beirut, uh, pictured here on the left, uh, was a scene of a battle, actually it wasn't really a battle, it was a destruction of, of a few Ottoman uh, naval ships and the bombardment of the port. Uh, the town of Kushadisa on the Aegean coast of, An of Anatolia was also subject to uh, bombardment. And eventually uh, the Italians seized the Dodecanese Islands, uh, which later became uh, a diplomatic uh, issue. But for the Ottomans, what proved decisive was not so much what was happening in Libya after things ground to a, a more or less ground to a halt, uh, but rather the uh, outbreak of what for, proved to be the first of two, the two Balkan wars. The Ottoman Empire hastily withdrew the mass, vast majority of its officers to fight a much more uh, potentially lethal conflict from Istanbul's perspective. Uh, it left only a, a skeletal uh, presence and um, quickly signed the, the, the peace treaty of, of uh, Ushi, which effectively ceded the territory uh, to Italy, but retained uh, a recognition that the Ottoman Sultan as Caliph uh, had, had a role to play in, in the territory. Uh, and in practice retained the means to carry on or at least encourage uh, a small uh, guerrilla style war that, that, um, but with a much less uh, active presence. Effectively, after this point, uh, the war became an italo sanusi conflict with much less uh, Ottoman involvement. Uh, the, by, the, by the terms of, of Ushi, uh, the Dodecanese were, were meant to be returned to the Ottoman Empire, but they retained, but 
Italy retained them and, and did not relinquish them until after uh, World War II. Now I'll turn to some of the uh, broader uh, consequences uh, from the war. In general, uh, in military terms, there's, there's, this is a kind of proving ground for some, some novel um, um, techniques or, or technology. We have the use of aerial reconnaissance, aerial forward observation, armored cars, and a few things like that. But also it proved the, the sort of strengthening of existing uh, trends, the, 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 the interest on the, on the Ottoman part of uh, insurgency tactics flipping uh, the tables on, on uh, their previous experience in Macedonia. Um, and the idea of linking an Ottoman officer corps with uh, local tribal forces providing the sort of bulk of the fighting force. And that's a pattern that we see uh, that will reappear, uh, however, with less success uh, in World War I, uh, particularly in, in the Ottoman defense of uh, Mesopotamia and the Mesopotamia campaign. So in, in, in Libya, the, the Ottomans were effectively trying to emulate the insurgents they had been fighting in Macedonia. Uh, but uh, as I said, as I mentioned before, th th there were these problems of, of rivalries and feuding and, and um, bad blood between some of the officers. So we have uh, tensions that develop between Mustafa Kemal and Enver, for example, which reached even the, the ears of the Grand Vizier in 1913. Um, a, a problem between Aziz Ali al Masri and Enver, which eventually was presumably instrumental in Ali. Aziz Ali's defecting to the Arab nationalist cause in World War I, or even before World War I, and a feud between uh, Suleiman Askari and Aziz Ali. As, uh, as my colleague Talha Chichek nicely put it, although these were known as the unionist officers, they were anything but united. Riven by rivalries, cliques, jealousies, and egos, they were a quarrelsome lot. And yet in this war, they exhibited a fair degree of organization and discipline. This was the first of a number of conflicts in which the network of activist officers would form the, who would later go on to form the Teshkilat um, and the, 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 the successes that they registered in, in Italy, against Italy in, in Libya, seem to have encouraged Enver to constitute that force uh, later on. So we could see as a kind of experiment or a kind of laboratory for the campaigns to, to come. First of all, of course, the Balkan Wars, and then interestingly, after the Balkan Wars, the, the brief episode of the, uh, the independent um, government of Western Thrace that the Ottomans set up as a kind of bargaining chip at the end of the Second Balkan War, in World War I, of course, and in the, in the Turkish War of Independence um, after 1919. This was, a, of course, a long and often ugly period of violence, deprivation, ethnic cleansing, and worse in which the Teshkilatu Masasa eventually would play an outside, outsized but often sinister role. The war in Libya, however, left the kind of abiding impression that having achieved something important against a European power, the Ottoman military was, was, on, was destined for greater things. The idea that the war, which had appeared utterly hopeless at first from an Ottoman perspective, had turned into something very close to a success against the Italians, was they thought surely the sign of more to come. This proved a persistent, if overly optimistic line of thought and one which affected further CUP decision-making in the years ahead. The feeling that a potential and rare victory and needed victory from the Ottoman perspective had been snatched from them by the timing of the outbreak of the Balkan Wars was a feeling that, that was only, only, added to, only added to the bellicose thinking of the unions, often with disastrous results. Ottoman officers training and fighting and working closely with local tribal forces seemed to be a winning combination. Also extremely, an extremely cost efficient one uh, for the depleted army, Ottoman army facing conflicts over a wide geographical area. So that, that's not an inconsiderate uh, aspect of this whole thing. Sending a, a, a relatively skeletal core of officers to uh, work with a much broader uh, fighting force supplied locally, many of, of which were volunteers was of course uh, very, very handy for the fiscal aspect of the conflict. The war can be seen as a significant moment 
in what, the, what was emerging to be an increasingly important battle for international public opinion. The vehicle for this was the coverage in the press and increasingly photographs, as, as we've seen. Embedded correspondence uh, are, are rife in this, in this, uh, on, the, on the edges, fringes of this conflict, as also was the idea or the issue of bias or, or partisan reporting. European observers received extremely mixed messages about the conflict, uh, provided by a fairly large number of foreign correspondents covering the war, most of whom adopted a remarkably partisan uh, approach to the fighting. And, and some of these, uh, some of these uh, reporters, and we have the example from on the English side of Ernest Bennett, uh, the former MP and war correspondent who had covered the Boer War, for example, um, uh, adopted a, a kind of almost sporting, jolly, humorous approach to the conflict, as if war journalism was a kind of adventure. Um, and he, his, his, his reportage was, was remarkably uh, partisan, and extremely anti-Italian, um, and um, what was a contrast to, to what other European readers were reading from the French side of things. Bennett was a graduate of Hartford College, Oxford. He'd commanded a pl platoon in the Boer War and been elected liberal MP in, in Woodstock, Oxford in 1906, lost his seat in 1910, and then returned to journalism. He had previously covered the Cretan insurrection of 1897 and Kitchener's Khartoum uh, campaign, where he witnessed the, the Battle of Omdurman. He publicized atrocities committed by the British Army, for which he was criticized at home. Bennett covered the, the war in Libya for The Guardian and also wrote the book With the Turks in Libya, which was published right after in 1912. He really enjoyed uh, criticizing, took, took great pleasure in criticizing the Italian army. Mm -hmm. He referred to them at one point as unseasoned neurotic Italians mm -hmm. and played up the novel savage trope of the fanatical mm -hmm. Arabs. That mainly was complimentary towards the, the Turkish officers whose quote, magnificent morale in the face of much larger and better equipped invading force, he praised. On the French side of things, and this is uh, thanks to uh, the work of uh, Pierre Schiel, who's, who's, the, who's the cover of whose book is, is there on the right. I only received a copy a few days ago, so I haven't had the chance to fully engage with it, but he um, investigates the, the archive of the French novelist and journalist named Gaston Chéreau, who was sent to cover the war for the French daily uh, Le Matin. Uh, after the war came to a surprising standstill, or a standstill for those who expected uh, an Italian uh, cakewalk, Le Matin uh, sent him to the front. This is late November 1911. At this point, the Italians had managed to secure only a thin strip of, of coastal area and were meeting with the unexpectedly fierce resistance mentioned before and they were taking occasionally severe casualties. The Italian army had, had reacted harshly in some cases, as noted, with reprisals against the civilian population. This in turn generated criticism in the European press from journalists such as Bennett, um, reporting from the, the Ottoman Arab side of things. Chéreau's paper, paper hoped to increase public support for the Italian cause. Sending a well-known writer to cover the conflict was the idea, but he seemed to have stayed in or very close to Tripoli for most of his time. The downside, of course, of being embedded and being only pro prohibited, he was prohibited, for example, from going to Cyrenaica, uh, where the fighting was fiercer. Eventually, he returned to France, but not before filling numerous filing numerous reports, which largely praised the Italians and criticized the Ottoman Arab resistance. He, his photograph, really rich uh, photographic collection, shows some pretty gruesome things, including the, the, the hangings of, of Arab uh, traders from the Italian side of things and uh, corpses apparently mutilated, uh, mutilated corpses of Italian soldiers, uh, as well as daily life in Tripoli, all with captions in Italian, French, and English to get the word to a much broader uh, audience. European public opinion was, was clearly and predictably important to both sides. The war was a cause celebre, and the war had a, had a ready and, and large readership. What was perhaps less obvious was the determination of the Ottomans to engage with potential sy sympathizers and financial contributors throughout the Islamic world. There was the nascent idea of, of, of trying to affect global public opinion. And this fits very nicely with recent work 
by scholars such as uh, Murat Shivilolo and Jamil Aydin. The key Ottoman actors seem to have internalized the idea that the war was part of something larger than merely the Ottoman Empire. Enver wrote that the defense of, of Tripoli was, quote, a moral duty that the Islamic world expects of us. They had operationalized this through the symbolic presence of what we, what we might call Muslim VIPs. And here's again the, the photograph showing Sheikh Saleh Sheikh Tunisi uh, alongside uh, Enver and his father. Uh, in, in the previous photograph of the travelers incognito, we saw uh, one of the sons of, of uh, the um, Algerian hero, Abdul Qadir. The war received widespread coverage in the Ottoman press with illustrated stories uh, featuring uh, some of the key combatants, uh, but this went well far beyond just being an Ottoman affair. The cause had clearly had a broad appeal. Fighters appeared from a, a quite wide variety of, of, of geographical sources, from Fezan in the south, as might be expected, from the Tuareg regions uh, to, the, to the south and east and, and west, uh, from Tibu in, in today in, in Burkina Faso, from Egypt, from the Sudan, from Lake Chad, and even from Afghanistan. Fighters were not limited to men. Reports of local female fighters who demanded carbines from the Ottoman uh, officers and who were reported to be extremely fierce in their approach to fighting. Enver described the female fighter who he encountered in Benghazi, who despite having been wounded by shrapnel in her chest, refused to stay in hospital and de departed to encourage her warriors. All in all, there's evidence of what Eric Zürcher has referred to as a kind of Muslim nationalism, or perhaps uh, as, as uh, Jonathan McCollum refers to it, Muslim anti-colonialism. This obviously had distinct advantages for the Ottoman Empire, given the difficulty of infiltrating their own soldiers to the front. It also demonstrated the advantages of the Ottoman stance of, of being a kind of anti-colonial empire. Tricky though that balance may have been. McCollum, for example, is excellent on the operations of the Ottoman Red Crescent, especially good on the ways that the Ottomans uh, used humanitarian aid to further uh, the war effort. But let's, in, in, in what the time that's left, I'd like to briefly explore what was going on in two other regions uh, of, of the Muslim world, namely Egypt and then India. In, uh, here's, here's a close up of Sheikh Saleh Sharif, who was acted as a kind of key Ottoman uh, figure. And then of course, as Odil told us last time, uh, went on to play a supporting role in the Turkish War of, Pen War of Independence in the uh, so-called uh, Kuvayi Milie period. In neighboring Egypt, this period saw increasing nationalist activity, but also loyalty to the Ottoman Empire, whose sovereignty over what was still technically its province was only the thinnest of de jure status since the British occupation in 1882. When Italy invaded Tripoli, Egyptian Ottomanists or pro-Ottoman Egyptians responded quickly. Egyptian newspapers carried stories of funds being collected to support the Ottoman volunteers. Women in Egypt played a particularly important role. For example, in, in the, the periodical El Afaf, one reader described herself as a Muslim Egyptian Ottoman woman and asked her, her compatriots for donations. Awake, awake, she wrote, hurry, hurry, take off your ornaments and jewelry, leave behind your silk and brocades, give up coquetry, coquetry and amusement, listen to the voice of duty that calls you. By way of example, this anonymous offer cited a woman who had do donated over 700 Egyptian pounds to the cause. Clearly this was a cause that attracted elite women those with silk and, and brocades and jewelry to, to relinquish for the conflict. One woman collected over $4,000 and no less than, than the Ottoman Egyptian princess Shive Kyar, who had previously been married to the future King Fuad, but was plenty wealthy in her own right, donated 6,000 British pounds to the Ottoman Navy cause. Those with le lesser means organized speeches, parties and committees, both in Cairo and in the countryside. But nowhere was this, did the success of the Ottoman cause appear more than in, in an India, British ruled India. Their widespread and sustained interest in responses to the conflict came from across the continent. Muslim Indians expressed support for the Ottoman empire and indignation with and condemnation for what they called shameless Italy's brigandage. 
There was popular unrest followed by meetings in Calcutta, at Lucknow, and at Madras. There was a boycott of Italian goods with successes reported in Bengal, the United Provinces, and the, and the Punjab. Requests for London to interfere, interfere on the Ottomans' behalf also appeared, somewhat uncomfortably for uh, the British government. There was tremendous solidarity with and fundraising for the Ottoman Red Crescent Society. Contributions large and small, including some from children, some of whom were reported to be mimicking the Turks and fighting the Italians in their play, poured in. Students at the Anglo, uh, Anglo Oriental College, which had been founded by Syed Ahmed Khan, forsook their weekly favorite dish of pilau zarde and saved the money they would have spent in returning home to their families in order to contribute to the war relief fund. There was, generally speaking, pressuring of, of the British government, despite its quote unquote neutrality, to uh, encourage, um, but, but these were met only by British resistance or demurral. The war had interesting effects locally in India, including the reconciliation of traditional ulama and Western educated Muslims in India, both, uh, who came, both, of, whom, both of which groups came together uh, because of the war and the, the perception that it was part of a sort of broader global threat uh, to Muslims worldwide. So the politicization of some of the ulama in India, previous which previously had been relatively quietist, uh, was, was a new political problem for HMG to deal with uh, in its uh, key overseas province or possession. The politicization of the students at Oligar, up, up till then relatively um, apolitical, who engaged in secret meetings and speeches focusing on the worldwide plight of the Muslims, uh, unsettled the, the British uh, rulers in, in India. And they were now worried, they now refer to the school as a quote, a hotbed of sedition and, and worried about the coalescing of a Hindu Muslim alliance against British rule. The press agitated against, against the war and despite the restrictive press act of, of 1910, articles calling attention to quote, shameless European expansionist designs and attacks of Christianity on Islam appeared regularly. A number of periodicals saw their circulation rise from four to five times. This pre presented the British uh, rule with, with serious problems uh, in, in its prime colonial possession, as I said. War and the, and the weak uh, British response was considered to be a blow to British prestige among Indian Muslims, leading to a rapprochement with the Hindus. There were, there were calls to join the Indian National Congress. There was a rise of a new leadership of Indian Muslims. Some, some refer to them even as the Indian Young Turks who came to the fore, including uh, Muhammad Ali, an outspoken champion of the Ottoman cause, and more broadly of Muslim political interests worldwide. We can say that in a way this, the, the fighting in, in Libya and the attention it received around the world paved the way for a broad-based pan-Islamic movement, which was well organized and was very uncomfortable uh, for uh, the British among others. This was a different kind of pan-Islamic movement than, than the more defensive version uh, thought of and, and, and orchestrated by Sultan Abdul Hamid II in the previous era. Even more worrisome for the British were the increasingly increasing clear signs of, of a Hindu Muslim rapprochement uh, against uh, uh, British rule. The Hindu press was arguing for British intervention on the side of Turkey. For example, the English language Punjabi on October 7th, 1911, two days only, two days after the fall of Tobruk, asked, quote, why Great Britain, the strongest and most influential power, has not protested against Italian aggression and implored London to act because of the 100 million Muslims under British rule. Global Muslims as both political and financial supporters became a, a, an important feature in the uh, surrounding this conflict in which uh, we, we see the cost and the cause of the war internationalized. It's often said that the first casualty of war is the truth, but also of course, it was, the war was also spur for remarkable creativity and no little frequently misplaced optimism. The Ottoman Italian war shows no shortage of attempts at mobilization, volunteerism, fundraising, propaganda, etc. With a relatively small number of officers and arms in the conflict, the Ottoman empire was able through clever attention to global trends to leverage an international sensation. Sadly for the empire, the enthusiasm it produced, though somewhat revived during World War I, would, would not be too much, would not be sufficient to help in the larger conflicts to come. 
but the anti-imperial baton, always somewhat awkward for an empire to espouse in the first place, would be taken up by a long list of nation states in the years to come. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, that was a really excellent lecture. And I see that there's already several questions um, queued up, which I'll get to soon. Um, I'll just remind everyone that, yeah, it's much better if you put your questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat where we might miss them. Um, and that uh, anyone who has to disappear now or, or later can uh, watch this again on our YouTube channel. Um, so I think um, I will, I'll start um, with the first question we received, which is from um, Ian Lowell, um, who writes, and I quote here, it's interesting that there was a flexibility in the execution of this conflict on the side of the Ottoman officers. Why was this experience and understanding not employed against the British in World War I? Question. And maybe we could add here, if there was, if you came across any relation between the strategy pursued in, in Libya and what the Ottomans hoped to um, achieve in, in Egypt if they had been successful in bridging the, the Suez Canal. Yes, okay, well, thanks. But for, for, to uh, Ian Lowell's question, I mean, it, one can see examples of the Ottomans attempting to uh, employ this kind of flexibility or this kind of flexible approach in World War I. The problem was it didn't come off very well. So uh, Suleiman Askeri, who was uh, crucial in the, in the, uh, to the Ottoman uh, defense of Libya, uh, was sent to Iraq in, in, the, in Mesopotamia during World War I and tried to do the same thing with the Iraqi tribes. Um, and he died in the process. Uh, and the, 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 essentially the, the, the tribal forces uh, in Iraq, um, perhaps because they were facing a very different army in the British army, perhaps because there was not much less time to organize, or perhaps because of the tribes themselves and their relation to the Ottoman Empire, um, whatever the, the combination of factors was, we, we see nothing like the, the, the stiff resistance that uh, the Senussi Ottoman combination produced, produced in Libya, but it's, it was not for a lack of trying. So, um, but it was, it was spectacularly unsuccessful. So for the big success that the Ottomans um, achieve in the Mesopotamian campaign, namely the arrest of, uh, I mean, the, the capture of uh, General Townsend and his army uh, is mainly because, not because of the tribal levies, but because of uh, more, more standard tactics. And one has to say, a blunder on the part of Townsend in retreating to what was effectively a peninsula, uh, river peninsula, which effectively uh, allowed his troops to be surrounded. So what was, uh, uh, what was the second part, um, Daniel, that, about uh, the whole? That yeah. was just my addition, whether, whether they perhaps, yeah. I, whether they hoped for something similar in Egypt when they sent this very small um, force to try and breach the canal. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 on. I my view is that this it was unlikely actually that the Ottomans expected um, that attack to actually succeed or for them to to, to capture um, uh, Egypt. The the only real hope was if if the Egyptian people had risen up uh, en masse and and had um, you know attacked the, the the British occupying forces from behind, uh, but that certainly didn't happen. Um, but what the attack on the canal did was to tie up huge numbers of, of, of forces from elsewhere in the empire, especially from, um, from Australia and New Zealand uh, in Egypt because, they, because of the attack, the British command knew that they might have to defend uh, the Egypt itself as, as opposed to just being merely a way station for troops moving towards the European theaters. So. Mm -hmm. In, in some sense, it was a success in that it, it tied down uh, numbers of large numbers of troops that could have been sent elsewhere. Mm. Okay. Um, okay, our next question from Fatma Sareya Gaven. Uh, she writes, and I'm quoting here, what would be the benefits uh, of reminding of such history for today? 
how could it be helpful to bring peace to an area or the Middle East? I don't know if you want to venture into lessons for today from, from this uh, episode, but uh, I'll leave it to you. It's usually wiser for us historians not to try to <laughs> engage in those kinds of questions, but it's a good, it's a good question and it's a fair one. Um, I mean, you know, at the very least one, one would say that optimism for conflicts tends to be uh, exaggerated beforehand and um, you know we can see certainly from the from the Italian side of things and perhaps also from the Ottoman side of things that um, it was it was very it was relatively easy for people to work themselves up into the belief that the, the, that war was going to solve problems um, and you can understand it from the Ottoman side of things from the young Turk perspective they were they were sick and tired of a of a, a kind of passive Ottoman approach to European diplomacy, which always, even if they won a war, they lost the peace. If they lost a war, they lost the peace. Mm -hmm. They felt the deck was stacked against them. And you can understand there's also a sort of generational frustration with the older um, gray beards in, in the Ottoman, uh, in, in the ranks of the Ottoman uh, senior officialdom. Uh, and so you can understand a frustration and, and these were military men who were who were trained to believe that they could they could solve the problems of of the empire, um, but yeah, in, in retrospect, um, it was it was madness, and the Ottoman Empire probably would have done well to to um, to take different lessons from the conflict than the, than they eventually took. Um, okay, and uh, our next question, uh, Jamil Sharif. Uh, he writes, uh, in London, the British Red Crescent Society was formed to send a medical mission to Tripolitana, uh, founded by Said Amir Ali, a privy councillor. Uh, have you found reference to this initiative? That's really interesting. Th thanks for bringing that up. I, I haven't actually, and I, but, but I have a, a, a read uh, references to the sort of absence of, uh, a, of just that sort of British military medical mission. For example, um, Bennett's, uh, in Bennett's writing, he says, you know, why, he, he talks about the, the excellence of the, uh, the German medical mission. And he says, why couldn't the, the British have done the same thing? And, and why, and it would have been of, of huge sort of um, propaganda value, if nothing else, for the British, given the number of uh, worldwide Muslims who were focused on the conflict. But I, so I would be very curious to know what happened uh, with that, that whole uh, attempt and, and if they actually did send something to Libya, but I haven't seen anything to suggest that a mission actually materialized during the conflict. Yeah, if I'm not mis misremembering, I think that Saeed Amir Ali was part of the um, delegation from British India at the League of Nations that kind of advocated against the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire to such an extent. Uh, the peace conferences so we see like a you know, long-running engagement you had um okay our next question this is a long one from ketty uh ianan tu wono i'm really sorry if i had a name um my pronunciation that is not your you're having it uh she says uh or i assume it's a she sorry uh, they say, thank you for this highly interesting talk. I would like to ask a question about propaganda and ideological narratives constructed around the conflict. In Italian propaganda, the, Italio, the Italo-Ottoman War was largely advertised and justified through a striking appropriation of ancient Roman culture. For example, in a notorious Italian poster advertising the war, an Italian soldier is shown while taking up a Roman gladium, the sword, from the skeleton of an ancient Roman soldier laying on the North African shore. The telling motto, Retornem Remo, we will bring back, appeared on this poster as well. I was wondering if you encountered any response to this Italian rhetoric in Ottoman and or international accounts of the conflict. Uh, and they add, thank you again for your talk and thank you for your attention. I should have let Nicolo ask that one. We'll give him a <laughs> anyway, so. No, I think it's a good one, actually, because it takes us back to, well, the conversation Ben and I were having before the 
the talk. Uh, so it's a very interesting one. It is indeed. I, I mean, I, and I don't know about the Italian side of things, but um, I don't, to answer the, the specific question, I don't see any evidence, direct evidence of the Italians, of the Ottomans trying to uh, sort of count, use counter propaganda against the sort of classicizing motif of, uh, of the Italian uh, propaganda effort. Uh, but certainly some of the, the uh, journalists embedded with the Ottoman Arab forces uh, were particularly critical and scathing of uh, the comparisons between the prowess of Italian or, or Roman imperial arms and the current uh, Italian descendants. I mean, so that they, they drew a huge contrast between, uh, you know, the, 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 the military successes of the Roman Empire and in their view, the complete uh, lack thereof uh, on, in, in the current uh, situation. But I haven't seen any, any actual Ottoman uh, responses. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, Said, Said uh, sorry, on the question of um, Said Amir Ali, uh, Jamil Sharif adds, just for interest, that apparently there's a, uh, it's well documented in his memoirs, this, his activities during the Libya conflict. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, the next question is from uh, Russell McGurk, who writes, Enver's brother Nuri and Jafar al-Askari did in fact form a similar arrangement in Sirencia and the Western Desert in 1915-16. And maybe I can just say that the Sanusia's um, incursion into Egypt and their British um, counterinsurgency or, or, or campaign against them is going to be the subject of the lecture in one month's time. So perhaps that will be discussed um, on the 25th of November. But uh, you're welcome to, to add to anything about that, Benjamin. Um, Just very briefly, uh, yeah, th thanks to Russell McQuirk for, for bringing that up. Yes, uh, the Ottomans, you know, as I said, there was, they left behind a kind of skeletal force mm -hmm. and this was um, instrumental in sort of keeping the, the, the conflict rumbling along, but uh, obviously with much less uh, Ottoman involvement than before, just in, in, in numerical terms, um, because of the, the need to, to bring almost everyone back to fight the, the Balkan Wars. But yes, the, the, the um, Ottoman role continued. And of course, um, uh, as uh, Odile knows very well, that the, the Teshkilat Masusa was was involved all across uh, North Africa and and uh, and you know in, in much further uh, flung areas, including Iran during the war. So um, yeah, plenty of plenty of uh, interest on the Ottoman side in 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 using these kind of what might call low grade uh, conflicts and keeping them uh, alive. Maybe. Um... We could add us that Nuri is the subject. I mean, the I suppose there might be a connection between these practices and 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 then the Caucasus Army of Islam and the way that they tried to recruit. Uh, they they did a similar procedure of recruiting locally during their campaigning. I mean, I think they were yeah they, they were basically making a virtue of, of, of a necessity. I mean, they, you know, they didn't have. Certainly in, in Libya, they, there was no way the Ottomans could send large numbers of troops. In those other conflicts, also, there was no way of, of sending large numbers of troops. So they had to kind of, in, in recruitment terms, they effectively had to live off the land and, and recruit locally and rely on their networks, which were extensive, uh, but which did not always lead to the kinds of successes that, I mean, in some ways, you could say maybe the, the their companion, their, their relationship with the, the, the Sanusia effectively spoiled them because no one else really fought like uh, they, they would expect the, the Sanusia, you know, to do. And, and they never again recaptured that same kind of winning combination. Okay, there are still several more questions. Um, let's see if we can get through them all. Um, Isabel Miller writes, was the British action in World War I in sending Lawrence and co. to the Hejaz in some respects a reaction to the Libya campaign, seeking to turn the tables on the Ottomans by using their tactics against them, or am I being fanciful? It's a good question. I, I mean, I haven't seen actual evidence linking 
I mean, I think it was just a just you know what the option that was available uh, to the British in trying to instigate uh, a crisis for a problem, an insurrection against uh, Ottoman rule in in, in Hejaz. Um, I've never seen conscious reference to the Libyan campaign, but of course everyone knew that it was that it was, was part of the immediate past. Um, but I think you know weighing the ambitions of, uh, of some of the Hejazis, I mean, the, the Hashemites, uh, and the promise of independence and the ability to send huge numbers of weapons and, and, and gold uh, to the insurgents was a kind of, you know, was, a temp too, was too tempting of a, of a proposition for, um, for the British during the war. Yeah. And then maybe um, Isabel can look at, you know, we already mentioned, I think you already referred to um, Talhad Shijek and, and also Salim Tamari have both written on how, this kind of competition over the loyalties of, of notable uh, Arabs in Syria and Palestine during the conflict. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of good good work on that, um, including Michael Province on on late Ottoman officers and and what happens after the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next uh, question, um, well, is a is from uh, Vebi Baisan. Um, that he, he asks, how successful do you think were the activities of the Teshkilati Masusa in Libya? Although this is acron anachronistic, I think because they won. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, um, in defining the fate of Ottoman military op operations. Yeah, first of all, uh, hi, Vehbi. Good, good to be in touch with you. Um, I, yeah, I think it, it is a slight anachronism, but but the because the Teshkilati Masasa was not formed until later, but uh, essentially the idea seems to have uh, come from the activities of the Ottoman officer corps, and especially the sort of um, yeah the, the Fedai officers in Libya, uh, and uh, that seems to have put the idea into, into Enver's mind. And, and of course, the, there was a huge overlap in personnel between those, excuse me, officers who fought in Libya and the key, um, the key operatives in the Teshkilat Masa, not least uh, Suleiman Askeri, who was uh, charged with, by Enver with, uh, Enver with uh, heading it up. And on the question of their success, I guess you've you've given some indication during the I lecture. Mean, successes is a relative thing, but I think it, I think without the, the successes that they certainly had in 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 Libya, in in Trablus Garb, uh, perhaps we wouldn't have had as much attention paid to the kind of idea that that coalesced in the Teshkilat Masa. I mean, I think I think it's it, it was a very attractive proposition to believe, and perhaps only someone who'd come through the officer, Ottoman officer corps could have believed that this sort of magic would have happened between, you know, the, 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 the you know, supremely well-trained Ottoman officers, presuming their, their motivation, of course, with uh, the local tribal force. So this was, a, this was a model that could be, in theory, applied almost everywhere. As we've seen uh, in Iraq, it, it didn't happen. And in many other places that, you know, the sort of the, the magic wasn't recreated. Mm. But I mean, you know, they look, look at the, ex the brief experience of the independent government of Western Thrace after World War II, similar thing. They tried to, you know, raise local forces with a kind of very skeletal group of, of Ottoman officers, including Suleiman Askari, including uh, Kushibashi Eshref, uh, including his brother, and a number of other people, they, they tried to hold on to this, this uh, create a government, hold on to a territory using local population, um, recruiting a, a militia, uh, basically on the same uh, level, and then they uh, the same on the same pattern, and then they felt that they were sold out by the Ottoman government in 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 uh, negotiating the peace treaty. So again, they you know they felt perhaps that um, this they 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 had they had were onto a winning formula, but were not allowed to. Uh, carry it out. Of course, subsequent conflict in World War One proved that it perhaps wasn't such a universally applicable winning formula. Mm. Thank you. Um, 
So I, the last question that we have, well, it's actually not exactly a question as the, as the writer uh, indicates. This is from, but it's quite an interesting quotation, which uh, I'll read out. Um, David Tong um, provides a, a quotation from Halide Adib, which is uh, an endorsement of, of what you were saying, I think. Um, Halide Adib apparently later wrote, presumably in the, must have been in the later 1920s. Uh, the campaign in Tripoli and its chivalrous spirit had vaguely and almost agreeably flattered the nationalistic tendencies, which had hitherto been nebulous. Perhaps if the unfair treatment we received from without after the disaster of the war had not knocked us so hard, we might have never been awakened and developed into very enthusiastic nationalists. Hmm. Really interesting, especially in light of you know, everything that we've been talking about in terms of uh, sort of ideological aspects of, of the conflict and especially the, the, the key activist officers. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and one last question um, has come in from um, Alexandros Lamprou. Um, he writes, uh, did the meeting of Staff College Ottoman elite officers with provincial irregulars and tribesmen have any visible effect on the way that CUP and later Kemalist elites viewed or would view the non-elite Muslim population of the empire slash republic? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. Uh, I mean, my initial reaction would be that it it it, it was of a piece and, and, and also reinforced the idea that, um, you know, the, the, the elite officers had the proper solutions. All they only needed was, was time um, and opportunity to implement them. And of course, we know from the work of uh, Shukrahaniolu and others that, that uh, they, these officers educated in the, in the elite military schools of the empire had developed, had, had, had latched on to selective works, political works, um, sociological works in, in Europe that played into or flattered, as, as, you, as you, this questioner says, uh, th their sort of elitist uh, ideas and, and reinforced the idea that it was in fact the military elite who, who, who should and would uh, lead, lead the country forward, whether it was the empire or uh, effectively the same people uh, having shed uh, a number of um, personalities, but essentially the same type of people who, who effectively established the, the Turkish Republic. Okay. Um... Okay, thanks. Um, I think that we better leave it there as it's officially our cut off. But um, maybe Nicolo has a, a question or a comment for, for Ben or the audience. Well, I mean, I'd like to thank Ben again for this wonderful uh, lecture. I think it was fascinating and extremely informative. And I mean, there will be so many things to discuss. Uh, again, looking back, the propaganda which was used during the colonial, uh, the Italian colonial period, and especially the differences between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, and how uh, the one in, in Tripolitania was actually supported by the archaeological evidence in the view of the Italians at the time, while in Cyrenaica we had something different. So it would be fascinating to explore also these differences in uh, the Libyan society at the time, whether there was any reflection of that. But these, I, I fear, would be actually a topic for a different talk. And a different talker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you can uh, move your research in that direction, Nicola. Um, <laughs> but thanks. Thanks, Nicola. And, and of course, thanks so much, uh, Ben, for this uh, really great lecture. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of really lucky to have such great speakers in this series and that will continue next month as mentioned. Um, thanks everyone for coming and asking questions and, uh, uh, and, uh, and being here. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.